Let's, let's just take the word first. What does it mean when you really analyze it? And you know that those chosen by God, Christ even if you would, being the first of the fruits. But to be a God's elect are considered to be first fruits. But to be first fruits, what does the word really mean? It means you're producing something or you're a product of something. Something has produced some fruit. In other words, you've done something. You've accomplished something. So let's have our minds right square, right here, out of the bar ditches and right up in the middle of the road. First fruits are people chosen by God that accomplish things and produce fruits because they're the first ripe. Okay? There are people that accomplish things. Now, lest I put anyone on a guilt trip, we are one body. And as we are in that body, the fruit we produce is equally shared by all concerned. But we do produce fruit. And I thank our Father that perhaps he has given us a little bit of leverage in as much as we have such a mighty platform in this day, in this hour, in this time. And that platform keeps growing, even going into Europe before very long, whereby we'll be in Europe at least once a week and perhaps more into Great Britain, Ireland, and um, some of the nations there. And, you know, it's, it's quite an advantage to produce fruit when you have that kind of a platform. And I like to think that we as a group did something to deserve that, else I do not think we would have it. And may we analyze fruit, first fruit, and stay worthy of that, to keep ourselves ever worthy before him, because indeed it is a pleasure to serve him in whatever capacity. And some might say, well, mine doesn't, my duties don't seem all that important. Well, beloved, all things are necessary in a body, and one might not appear, but let God be the judge. You're very important, or he wouldn't have touched you. You're a part of that body. And as the body continues to walk toward that final day, May it continue producing fruit. I want to go to the church of the first fruits, firstborn. Then I want to go to the first fruits of the spirit. I want us to analyze just a little bit. And within this, I think we can see and realize maybe some of the motions of God, what he expects of us. I want you to open your Bibles, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 12. Let me set the stage, if I may, because we're not going to cover all of it. Paul is teaching, and he said, say, let's gather together like a big cloud. That means all in one group, one body. And let us get ready, let us prepare to run a race. I don't know how many of you have, and perhaps I'm going to date myself, be that as it may, have been to the old country or city fairs where you have sack races, all right? You know what a sack race is? You take a gunny sack and two people put one leg each in it, and here you go. And as long as you keep in step, you, you can assure of yourself of one thing. Whoever wins the race usually is, are the, is the, the two that can be one body that keeps in step, or you fall, all right? You stumble. So we know then that as Paul says, gather in a cloud in one body, let's run this race all the way down to the wire, meaning the return of Christ as it concludes in the end of chapter 12, when God begins to shake this earth. And if you can be moved, he's going to shake you. The point is that you be matured well enough in his word that you're not shakable, that you're not a reed in the wind, that you know what your father expects of you that you're in position in that body, and it doesn't matter how much shaking goes on, you are solid on that rock bed. Okay, with that thought in mind, Paul continues on. He said, hey, the trip gets a little bit rough. And he said, some of you are already crying 
And you haven't even spilled blood yet, as Christ did on the cross. In other words, why did Paul say that? So that you would be sure in, or that we would in our minds to keep, thing in, keep things in perspective. The toast got burned this morning. God, what a tragedy. <laughs> oh, big deal. Put another chunk in or eat it burnt. One or the other, you know. Uh, don't, you know, that it's a crybaby that worries about junk like that. Not that toast is junk, but the fact that you would let a piece of toast upset you when a beautiful day is underway. And they're all beautiful when you're on the rock. You don't let things like that bother you. You can't produce much fruit if you're going to break up over a piece of burnt toast. You better check yourself out, friend, and see which socket you're plugged into. That might have been what made the toast burn in the first place. All right? So be a, be a fruitful person in as much as you show yourself approved and mature in God's Word, and mature people don't cry over burnt toast. Now, I don't know why I chose that analogy, but it worked out pretty good, didn't it, to show us what we're talking about. He said, it could get rough at times. He said, as a matter of fact, God's going to chastise some of you. But he said, don't worry about that. Even as your earthly fathers, they just have you for a little short time. Our Heavenly Father has to put up with you for an eternity. All right? And hopefully it's a good experience for him. Or you won't be with him that eternity anyway, all right? But that's where I want to pick it up at, and let's work first fruits into it from that viewpoint, if we may. Hebrews chapter 12, let's begin about verse 10, where we're speaking of fathers chastising. For they verily for a few days that your earthly father chastened uh, us after their own pleasure. The word pleasure is probably uh, a mis... It's not probably a mistranslation. It is. It meant to what they thought was best for you, all right? They took the pleasure of deciding what must be best, and it always hurts the parent as much or more than it does the child if the correction is given as it should be. But he, that's our Heavenly Father, for our profit. What does that mean? That means that your Heavenly Father does not only understand what happened to you from birth in this earth age, but what happened before. And some might say, and I apologize, well, what do you mean before? Before the foundations of this earth, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. For God hated Esau even while he was still in the mother's womb. And that hate did not come from our father against an innocent babe. It was what his soul accomplished while he was with our father. Yes, even in that world age of Satan's rebellion. All right? God knows those things. That we might be partakers of his holiness, not ours. If you want to know the truth about it, we don't have any holiness. About the time one of us gets to that point where we're really holy, Something happens that wakes us up to the fact that we're not. We're flesh, man, today. Only he is holy that is within us. And we always come back to that same point. We stumble and we fall. And I want to give you a word of advice. Sometimes that in itself is correction from your father. He wants to see how quick you can snap back how long it takes you to get up and stand up like a man or a woman or a child of God and prove to him that even though you fall, your desire is to stand. To stand against the enemies of our Father. That you're a fighter. That you're a producer. That you produce fruit. That your intentions are good. That goes a long way with him. I don't care whether it seems like you accomplish much or not. Your attention, your intentions go a long way with him. Verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. It hurts. And that's probably one of the, the hardest things for a Christian to discipline themselves in. 
is to know. I mean, you know when you blow it. You don't, no one has to tell you if you really stop, if you're analyzing yourself, if you take the time to meditate on something bad that happened to you, you know that nine times out of ten you brought it on yourself for not being careful enough or whatever the reason might be, whether it's financial or whatever. Don't try to blame someone else. That's when you withdraw out of a world of reality, and reality is the only thing that brings happiness in this earth age, is that you can face reality and say, I can cut it. Hey, I can get it done. Bring it on. And when you're armed with the Word of God, this set of instructions that he sent along with that little old body of yours telling you how to operate it, telling you how to give it happiness, peace of mind, prosperity. And if you don't have those things, maybe you've never read the instructions that came with you. They're from your father, he that designed the body, all right? They are grievous, and it hurts. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit. That's, you're a fruit producer then of what? Quiet fruit. You mature. A fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Exercised thereby in what? Love. You can't help loving he that disciplines you. That's just the way it is. How parents, how long it takes them to learn that lesson that your children love you because you love them enough to discipline them. And so it is in the church. It is a part of growth in God's Word. When He disciplines you, thank Him for it. You had it coming. Verse 12, Wherefore lift up the hands which hang down. If you see a brother or a sister with hands hung down, don't exile them, help them get their hands back up, uh, and the feeble knees, help strengthen that one, help people take care of their own problems, uh, don't be animalistic and go after our wounded and try to get them while they're in a weak state. You know, it's those of us when we shake for a moment and weakly fall and sin. I mean, but the body being weak, we fall in sin. That we need each other the most. Always remember that. It would seem to be the Puritan attitude that has developed within Christianity of late, of late, several, two or three hundred years or more, that Christians are perfect and they don't have time for the sinner, the one that falls, when in fact that's what Christians are about, is to help sinners. For we're all sinners. We all fall short. And we pick each other up and strengthen each other. You understand, just a smile can strengthen someone that's down on days. Just, just a little kind word to say, Hey, you look like you've got it under control. I thank God for you. Sometimes whether a person had it under control or not, they could bring on the tigers. They're ready because they've got a panther in their tank, then a compliment from you, a good word. That's fruit, and it grows, it expands, and it sets aside Christians from the troubled world today, all right? Help those that are at weak moments. We all have them. Don't try to lie to yourself. We all have those bad moments. Thirteen. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. We can do it. If someone is lamed by a sinful act, help them get the... If there's a rock in their road, go up and kick it out for them. Don't let them stumble over it again. Kick it out. By that I mean help them. Don't condemn them. Raise them up. 14. Follow peace. Don't only follow it. That's not enough. Pursue it. Did you hear what I said? Pursue peace. If, you're, if your day and your mind is upset, you've got a problem. 
You're certainly not pursuing peace. You're egging along this drum. And, oh, why does the world always pick on me? All right? You got a problem. You don't have peace of mind if that's your frame of thought. You are not following or pursuing peace. When you pursue peace, you pursue the answer to that thing that is disturbing you, and you get rid of the thing. It's probably satanic. It was probably brought about by one form or the other of you as one of God's elect that something uh, uh, thrown in your path by Satan that someone didn't kick out, that's when you kick out of your path, that you've got to be man or woman enough to kick it out yourself. Use common sense and get your path back in order. Okay? Pursue peace with all men and holiness. That's sanctification. But know this one thing. Holiness only comes from God, so don't ever leave him out of the picture. I want to be really good friends with this person. Don't leave Christ out of it if you're both Christians. All right? Or you won't have any holiness in that union, without which no man shall see God, because he is holiness, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace, or fall from grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. you know how fast roots grow? Hmm? If you let some little bad thought spring up in your mind or in your family that you don't resolve right then, well, let's just put it aside for the moment. That little sucker is going to be growing mightily while you leave it put to one side. That little root of upset, dissension, trouble. You know why? Satan's going to call his best gardeners. And he's going to say, fertilize it, prepare the ground well, cause it to grow, pray over it, little devils, and make it grow into a mountain. And you know what? It will. Hey, kill it while it's still in the root stage. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Do you understand where your father is? Do you understand what Paul is talking about? It's poison if you let it lay there. Get rid of the root itself, Okay. 16, sharpen up for me. We're going to a totally deeper level. That was, up to now, that was just for, for your own benefit in everyday life. We're going to start studying now, all right? Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, whom for one morsel of bread, of meat, sold his birthright. The word <coughs> fornicator, as it is used there, is a strange word. It's pronos, which means a male prostitute, a male whore. Don't be a male whore like Esau. Esau sold himself. He had the right of what? Firstborn. He had the right of what what does firstborn mean? Double portion. He had a double portion coming to him. Now let's tear this up a minute, all right? Let's just let's just analyze this. What does it truly mean? If God hated Esau, and he did, Acts chapter nine declares that. Malachi chapter one declares God hated Esau before he ever got in his mother's womb. Why? Because he was a troublemaker, even at Satan's rebellion. His soul was. Now, why in the world, then, would God allow him the privilege of being firstborn, which means the inheritor of the very lineage of what would have been all of Israel at that time? Think about that a moment. God allowed him. Now, let me ask you a question. Would God have honored his inheritance as firstborn if there had been a total change in Esau? 
Not even a total one, if he had tried. Good question. What? Why is it that God so often allows the firstborn to be born in the flesh and then we have to cross things over and give the blessing to somebody else? For this simple reason, God is totally fair. I think God knew Esau's character well enough. He wouldn't have hated him otherwise. But if he had, he would have still honored Esau's birthright. But Esau blew it again. It was not the first time. God does not hate someone for no reason at all. God uh, is totally, completely fair, and if you ever see him in any other light, you're wrong. You haven't read deep enough. You haven't looked deep enough. So, what can we say on this thing? I want to ask you a question. When were the first fruits actually chosen? Think about that a moment. When were the first fruits actually chosen? Though, we're going to find out here in a minute from the scriptures, naturally, I chose you before the foundations of this earth age, meaning, as it is written in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 in the Hebrew, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, period. It doesn't say when. It was billions of years ago. And then in the Hebrew, Tuhu Vabuhu in verse 2, the earth became void and without form. He didn't create it that way. God doesn't create junk. As it is written in Isaiah chapter, what, chapter 18 verse 45, or is it 45 verse 18? It's crossed in my mind at the moment. But be that as it may, he created the earth out of the water to be inhabited, not void, which the word void in the Hebrew tongue is tuhu. So, it was a beautiful earth at one time, and then it Satan's rebellion, kubo, as it is in the Greek. Men fell, but men were chosen. So, there are some people that have a destiny and there are some that have free will. That does not mean that God loves some of his children more than he loves others. It's just that some ripen first. Some mature first. Some matured, and even in the world it was, that God could depend upon them. You fathers and mothers, this is a subject that we don't like to talk about, but you can have two children. One can be mechanically inclined, and another can be book smart. I'm going to use that terminology. You all know what I mean. Now, you don't think any more of one of the children than the other, but if you have a broken lawnmower, which one do you send to fix the lawnmower? Naturally, the one that is mechanically inclined, but it doesn't mean that you respect the book learning boy the best or girl. You choose them for what they are best at, because that's how they fill out and round out the family. So it is with our Father, but he does not respect and is not a respecter of persons. He gives gifts. They're his gifts in the first place. So let's recap just a moment. I wanted to utilize this because Esau was brought into this for a very special reason. Although he was firstborn, he prostituted himself and sold that right, which was saying to God what? Now this is important. If you want to fall out of grace with God, this is one way you can do it in a hurry. God has given certain ones a heritage. You've earned it. It was given because you earned it. Don't snuff at it. Don't make light of it. Don't try to sell it. Well, how, 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 how in the world would I sell it? Well, if God has given you a gift, and you don't use it because you're too busy in things of the world. Well, I could take a little more time, but you know, I needed that new car. 
And there, now, don't say if somebody's working extra hours for because your old car is broke down, you're getting another one. Don't get on a guilt trip. All right. I have to be very aware of that because people are. That's one disadvantage of Christians. If you, while you're teaching and meaning all well, you can lose your point and put some innocent person on a guilt trip. All right. If you need transportation, but I'm talking about somebody that wanted one to polish and shine. All right, just in their spare time that they could have been doing something else. And I'm using that as an analogy only, all right? Something that gets in your way of giving God any time at all. And I'm going to tell you something. Your time is a lot more valuable to Him than your money. All right? Your time. There, why? Explain that. There might be one time that a person passes you that, well, they're, they're, they're um, meditating on taking their life. They're going to do themselves in. You may not even know them all that well. God may not have been using you up to that point. All it was was study, 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 look, learn, so, so and so forth. And that person is on, on his path through that day to committing this hideous act. And presto, you just happened by, but God saw to it you happened by. And you made one little statement. Isn't it wonderful how that every day in the Lord is a wonderful day? Isn't it wonderful that we have his words, his set of instructions that gives us purpose, gives us destiny, even let us know what this great nation, America, is all about. And, and I'm just saying any number of little things. It could have only been a smile of saying, Hey, the Lord has made us a good day, hasn't he? That sometimes is all it takes, friend, to take a mind that is twisted and that Satan has his clutch on to break that clasp and put that person back alive. I mean, it's a start. You see... Don't ever complain. If God is giving you knowledge and wisdom, it's not for no... It is not for no... What have we got going here? It has a purpose. It has a purpose. He wants to use you. Okay. And that's enough on Esau. I wanted to just take you back there to show you the depth of first fruits that you can't start it in this earth age. That wasn't the case with Esau that was used as the example. Quite frankly, neither was it with you. Okay, let's get back with the Hebrews chapter 12. Don't sell yourself as Esau did out. Don't sell yourself for something of this world. 17, for you know how that afterward, he, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was a first fruit. God would have honored it. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance. Though he sought it carefully with tears, he went one step too far. But then, so that you don't understand, he wasn't begging the Lord for for forgiveness. Um, repenting comes from a change of mind, and Esau was trying to change his father's mind. Not God's, his earthly father's mind, all right? That won't cut it with God, all right? So there was no room for repentance. Because he was trying to get something back that he had already prostituted. Don't prostitute the gift that God gives you. You think about it and you give it a serious thought. Eight tears don't make any difference. For ye are not coming to the mount that might be touched and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. And the sound um, of a trumpet, and the voice of words, which voice they that heard entreated that the word should not be spoken to them any more. Don't tell us any more of the sayings of God. We don't want to hear it. It's too hurtful. Twenty, notice the print. For they could not endure that which was commanded. And if so much as a beast touched the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a dart. Twenty-one. And so terrible was the sight that Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. All right? 
Even Moses himself admitted it was a sight to behold that could make the heart pump right real quick in the little old flesh body. And if any of you have ever had a near touch with our Father, you know what he's talking about. 22. But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and into the city of the living God. Now stop and think, what did it say? Is God some big uh, energy source out here? Well, I wish I could see him. No, he looks just like we do. We were made in his image. He has emotions. He loves. He hurts. He cries. He lives. Did you catch that? A living God, not a dead one. The heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels. Do you understand what's around you? Did you hear it? A living God and a company of angels. Do you not remember when uh, Elisha was facing on a mountaintop an entire army and his armor bearer said, Oh, let's get out of here. Let's go home. Let's get back to the campfire. And Elisha says, Oh, God, but could you rent the veil to that dimension and let him see what's just over our heads? And God answered that prayer and the veil of dimension was rent. And that entire army of angels just overhead frightened that enemy so bad that they ran themselves to death and over each other. God is promising you they're there. They are there. Do you think our Father is not in control? Do you think your little old life is so difficult that it's too big a job for Him to see that your little old life could be straightened out that quick? If your faith and your hope is in the rock, is in the truth, that he allows you, allow him to use you. To the, to the General Assembly and Church of the Firstborn. I want you to underline that in your mind, if not in your Bible. The Church of the Firstborn. It's a very important church. It's probably the most important church they will ever be. Well, how do I join that? I don't know. Take it up with him. He controls it. And as I've always told you, if he clears you, you can join this church anytime. But I cannot give you entrance. Only he can. Because he keeps the books. And if you're not in his book, it wouldn't matter how many books we put you on here. If you're not in his book, you've got trouble. You've got bad trouble. If you're good enough for Christ, you're good enough for us. You come on. All right. The church of the firstborn, meaning the church of God's elect. Which are, here's a qualifier, which are written in heaven, not on earth, in heaven. Why? He who is in heaven chose them in the first place. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That word perfect is mature. Mature in what? In his word. If you work at a job 20 years, you get better at it. If you work in a job 10 years, you get better at it, or you're what? You're not producing fruit. You're nothing. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel, the second Adam, the vengeance of Cain, in other words, the Kenite that was placed in the world, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that shake on earth, much more. Shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven? That's where it's at, friend. But don't remove that from your mind and say, well, that's a long way off. It isn't. Not for you, it isn't. Part is even within you, for you are a part of the body. Heaven is as near as the spirit that is in you of him. It is not something for tomorrow. It is something for today. You can begin now, as all of you have, in enjoying his protection, his blessings, his knowledge, his gifts. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more, I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. And this word, Yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as 
of things that are made, that is to say, created, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. How about you? Doesn't it seem pretty insignificant that if you let a piece of toast shake you up, that you're traveling in bad company? Hmm? Can you compare the last little thing that shook you up in priority to the end of this earth age and God shaking both heaven and earth and crying out to a people, have you learned from my word, can you stand, or will you be shaken also? What good are you if you can be shaken? Well, if a piece of toast shakes you, I'd say, when he shakes, you got trouble. you got to have it together better than that, friend. You see, the little toast is those little things that's put in your life that disciplines you so that we can find out, or he can find out, what kind of stuff you're made out of. Whether you can regiment yourself in this life and prepare yourself for that time of shaking, because indeed it is coming. But when you back off and look at the fact of how important his inheritance is, then the church of the firstborn begins to take us to the church of the first, the, the first spirit. And I, I want to touch on that real quickly. I'm, let's, let's turn to Romans chapter 8 here real quickly. Romans chapter 8, it's a, it's a chapter that we've all covered time after time. Let me, let me set you in place in case you cannot remember. This is that chapter where Christ, where Paul is teaching and said, hey, if you are really in Christ, you know that you have the victory over that flesh body. You know that, in fact, though it sins every once in a while, if you repent, you can destroy the flesh, the things of it. Why? Because when you are forgiven upon repentance, it's dead. The sin is dead. I want to say that again. So many put themselves on guilt trips and can't forgive themselves because, oh, I'd do better than that. I should have, should have never done that. You've already repented. He has forgiven you. He doesn't want to hear about it again. And when you talk like that, you're saying he's not able to forgive you. He doesn't like it. I don't care what your sin was. It could have even been an abortion or something worse. Once you repent and once you're forgiven, don't bring it up anymore. It doesn't exist. Or you're calling him a liar. You're saying he doesn't have the power and he shed his blood for you to defeat all sin. So don't be putting yourself on any guilt trips. Shake that stuff off. Declare it dead. You may fall in the next ten minutes again. Should I say that doesn't matter? Well, in relationship to, as to whether that's gone or not, it doesn't. You can't be an habitual sinner, which means one that we all continue sin because we're in the flesh. Habitual sinner is one that literally sets out to do no good. That's his religion. You're not that way. In your heart, you want to do what's right. All right? That's what this is about. And he says, in as much as you come away from that, and you know that in Christ we have the victory to make those things die, then for the sake of time, I want to pick that up in about verse 20. What? Let's go with, let's go with 20. For the... Even the very trees with the pollution and the acid rain and everything looks forward to the time that our bodies are reclaimed into the spiritual body in which we belong when our work is finished, not before. For the creature of the creation, verse 20, Romans 8, who has made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Hope is a big word. Because the creation may I, itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption unto the glorious liberty of the children of God. Beloved, my message is this. You can have that freedom 
You can have that liberty right now if you discipline yourself in repentance and in His Word and knowing that you need not fear anything because of His protection, His umbrella, His Spirit over you. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together, uh, together until now. And not only, listen to me closely, and not only they, that's to say the creation, but ourselves also. Don't you look forward to that time when you're going to be in that spiritual body? There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sin. Of course we groan for that. We're very impatient as we wait for it. Which have the first fruits, underline it, first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body, this old flesh body. Adoption is an interesting thing. Because in a sense, that's why we're sinners, all right? But each time we sin and we repent, he adopts us back in as a son or a daughter. You understand? A legal, fill it, uh, fulfilling adoption, which is to say forgiveness. And the thought, deeper thought is forgiveness, all right? You may prove yourself to not be a son or a daughter of God by your sinful acts time and time again, but each time you repent, from the heart, you are adopted back in as though it never happened. Why? Spirit, the first fruits of the Spirit, the first fruits of the saints. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for? You can't see that protecting hand that is just above you, but you can hope for that new body when you will be able to see it in that dimension. And were you to see it today, you wouldn't have any faith because it would be a reality to you. Okay, you understand where we're coming from? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? In other words, you know it's going to happen. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. No one knows 100% what it is that they are supposed to do in their lives. But if you have the hope and the faith to know, that you are one of the first fruits, he'll let you know, friend, when he's ready. But the Spirit itself, itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, cannot be uttered, cannot be spoken. You're, maybe you're not even supposed to know yet. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. God knows what the mind of the Spirit is, for he is the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints. Saints means what? Set aside ones. Set aside when? According to the will of God or his purpose. 28, listen closely. And we know that all things work together for, the, for good to them that love God, to them who are the called, not volunteered, called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow. I don't have to explain that to you for whom he did foreknow. What does that mean? Knew from before, a long time ago, an ancient time. Who he foreknow? Knew means what? Knew, if I know you, I know what I can expect from you. That means you are totally knowledgeable about the traits and character of an individual. They are predictable. In other words, if you overcame in the world that was, he knows that you can overcome here also. All right? You got it? He knows you're solid. He knows that he can count on you. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. He set the path and the first fruits, and the church of the firstborn, which is, if he is the firstborn, what is the church of the firstborn? It's the church of Christ. Am I talking about some name on a shingle out here today? No. All right. I thought the doors were going to swing open and people would be leaving rapidly you know, to head down the street. But, all right. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, 
then he also justified. That means he judged them there. And when he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things if God be for us? Who can be against us? You worried about your toast in the morning? If God be for you, how can that toast mess you up? Hmm? Think about it. You go out of the house in the morning and you're late for work and, man, there's the, the left rear is flatter than a flitter. How are you going to handle it? Hmm? Always remember this, there are things a lot more important. A lot more important, all right? It can't even compare to what is in store for us. It doesn't even deserve to be taken into consideration. If a tire is flat, what do you do? What does common sense tell you? Either change the thing. You have all kinds of alternate roots in this. You can change it yourself. You can call a garage and let them change it. Or you can go over to your neighbor and say, Hey, buddy, guess what? <laughs> I need a ride, all right? No need to get upset. It doesn't mean the world came to an end. Handle it. Handle life. You're one of God's elect. You're really somebody. Even though you do need a two before every once in a while, okay? You're somebody. You need discipline. Yes, our Father disciplines us. But how can we talk about these wonderful things and get upset over a flat tire or a piece of toast? All right? We can't. It's not logical. All right? It doesn't make since in about 10 minutes okay I just want to take time to read you one verse okay if God be for us who can be against us it doesn't matter whether they're against us or not who cares hey that, even in our platform there are many people that would like to have us out of certain towns do you think that worries me huh who cares what they think as long as we know what we're doing is according to this book as best we can do it. Because they cannot be against us to any point that they can do us any harm if we know God is for us. I think we got that worked out, all right? I think he has given us the advantage because we stand on reality. We know it's a fact. And do you know something? As long as we continue knowing that is a fact, we will continue growing. This ministry, I mean, a small church in northwest Arkansas, Lord, I can look across this room and I can see the steps as we took it from a roller rink to from, well, I can even go back further than that, living rooms with Bibles, all right? Living rooms, homes, all across this neck of the woods. But always knowing this is reality. We're not playing church. God is real. He lives. He has chosen you. You have a purpose. You're somebody. You're somebody that doesn't get upset about little old things in life. <laughs> no big deal. Turn to, with me to um, Philippians. Let's, I, I must go by there for one verse. Philippians chapter 3. I, I want to recommend that all of you read this third chapter that leads up to this. I'm not even going to take enough time to really give it a good... As it talks about the same subject, I want to read the 13th verse of, of the third chapter of Philippians. Brethren, I count not myself to be apprehended, that is, to that, that I've gained, that I've gone over the top, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. This will lead down to the change of body. For those of you that intend to make it as God's elect, that's a very important verse for you. Don't look back. The only time you should ever look back is to drag those bits of information out of your knowledge bank that, hey, you can get burned doing that. You understand what I'm saying? But don't look back blaming yourself or anyone. Look forward for our day of redemption 
draweth nigh. I want to go to verse, uh, let's read 20 and 21. For our conversation is in heaven. Do you believe that? From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body. Hey, don't, don't try to lie for it. Don't try to pretend. Be real. Our vile body. It is your flesh body that always drags you into sin. But it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto him. There is not one thing in this world that he cannot subdue. And if he's for you, again, what do you, what do you care who's against you? What do you care what's going wrong in your life? Why don't you get a little common sense in your head from this word and get it out of your life? Or get out of it. I'm not talking about life now. I mean the problem. You can handle it. It may take a little help. But you can accomplish it. Because he's going to see to it. It's his promise. And beloved, listen to me. First fruits produce fruit. There's going to be a day coming sometime after Antichrist has been on this earth. Many of you have planted seeds and the person walked away from you as if, I wonder where they got out of, you know, or I wonder where they came from, you know. But they don't forget, see. And someday when you're delivered up and you witness, and you're going to, you might say, well, that sounds unreal. Uh-uh. Danger. Real, friend. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. It's going to happen. Antichrist shall appear before the true Christ does. Then that person that snuffed at you is going to say, Hey, that person told me this was going to happen. I remember now. Why? Because you feel them. In closing, Revelation 14. Revelation 14, verse 3, I'll read as you get there. And they sang, and this is the 144,000, as it were, a new song. But you know what? It's the same old song, that song of Moses, that all of you have studied adequately and have it in your heart. Before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth, meaning what? They were redeemed from this earth's age because some person cared enough to plant a seed. One of the first fruits, who this is not talking about, cared enough to plant a seed. The results of it, verse 4, in closing, these are they which were not defiled with women, this has to do with the Nephilim, the fallen angels that fell from heaven, that seduced the daughters of Adam, and Geber, giants, were born to them in Genesis 6. Satan and his angels are going to be cast out into the earth very soon. There will be more Nephilim on this earth. These that had their seed planted will not be defiled by them. They are the bride of Christ, and they shall remain virgins in that sense. They will not prostitute themselves. For they are virgins, these are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he, go, he goeth. These were redeemed from among men. What? Fresh men, vile, fresh bodies. They were redeemed because somebody cared enough to try to produce fruit. First fruits just do that, don't they? That's how they became first ripe in the first place. Being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. May our Heavenly Father... Bless us through his word. And may the next time that you catch yourself on a deserted island, snow is waist deep, hailstones begin to fall, your car won't start, the wife just locked you out of the house, don't say to yourself, things are getting bad. <laughs> Look up. <laughs> All right, I'll be serious a moment. There is nothing too rough for you in this life if you are disciplined in Christ. Number one, 
he's not going to let anything happen to you that you can't handle. You can, with reality, stand and say, hey, friend, I can cut it. I'm not talking about being a smart aleck. I'm talking about you knowing you can. It's a reality. You're not playing. I can get it done. You know, even before I was uh, really dedicated to the point of dedicating my life to the Word, there was a time that I thought there was a hill I couldn't make. And then as a young man, I volunteered for the United States Marine Corps. And there was the meanest, ugliest man I believe I ever met in my life, and he had stripes on his arm. You know? And when we were worn to the point, there was no more ways. Have you ever been through Camp Pendleton? There's always another hill, friend. And he taught us that even when you thought you couldn't, by the time he got through with you, you could make one more hill. And there wasn't too much difficulty in doing it, all right? What was that called? Discipline. And you must discipline yourself in Christianity. Where does the word discipline come from? Disciple. You cannot be a disciple of Jesus Christ without disciplining yourself. That's what it means, student. So, we will all be students until that day comes. And friend, I promise you, there are no giants out there that we can't kick the stuffing out of. You understand? There are no tigers out there that we can't put back in the tank with his help. We have the victory. All right? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and your promises. We claim them, Father, as we grow and mature into adult Christians. When we were children, we played church. But as adults, Father, may we be a blessing. For